Yeah, a warm welcome from my side, ladies and gentlemen, here at the Responsible Leaders Dialogue at the BMW Foundation here in Munich. I not only welcome you, but I ought to thank you. Thank you that you make the way to come here. And that's a sign that things at least are coming a little bit back to normal and shows the possibility of social movements after those many months of lockdown and stillness. The freedom of and ability of social mobility leads us directly to our topic today, rethinking human mobility. Our speaker today, Parakana, welcome you here, invites us to rethink the possibility, the options and the limits of human mobility and links it directly to the consequences of society development. How often have you asked yourself lately, when will we be back to normal? And what was your answer? Soon? Never? The pandemic has shown us the price we pay for immobility. When people and goods stop moving, society grins to halt at the expense of well-being, prosperity, and basic advancement development. In an era of digitalization, you could assume that geography and distances don't play a role anymore. Information is available all the time at any place, fast, at low cost, so why moving? Ironically, even the digital industry is worldwide concentrated on a small number of regions, Silicon Valley, Shenzhen, London, Munich. It's even in your list of the privileged area, um, an alpine oasis which, due to its environment and this living uh, and this great quality of living, attracts people from all over the world. So, this dialogue is an open invitation to you. We will have a streaming to a broader public at the beginning, but then have a inside discussion in exchange about those possible trends, possible options, and the future we can think. From a local to a global perspective, the major current challenges, climate change, political instability, economic inequality, contrasting demographic developments, they are all interfering and will disrupt our pathways which we have known up to now. And that's why human mobility is much more complex than before. It's not just about going from A to B. It touches all the different dimensions of our life and future social development. And according to Parakana, today more people than ever will move around to take advantage of the opportunities for individual development. And the countries, the regions, the companies, which are able to harness this mobility will be those who have the most advantages in future. In a nutshell, it's about taking care of the key factors defining a prosperous and well-being future. And that's what the BMW Foundation stands for. We call that responsible leadership. More than ever, we need responsible leadership when it comes to find sustainable ways, fair ways, to craft a new peaceful future. Our mission is to inspire and globally connect people like Parakana to strengthen and to support the 2030 agenda of the United Nations and its development goals. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon, we want to assess with you the risk and opportunity of human development. And it's my utmost pleasure to welcome Parakana, world traveler, global advisor, best-selling author, but nevertheless also member of the BMW's foundation network. So I'd like to invite me, you to a warm welcome, uh, Parakana, here in Munich. Welcome. Before asking you on stage, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Perna, which will be leading us 
today through our afternoon, through our discussions. She's also a member of the Sundari Foundation Network, and she's partner at the Agora Strategy Group, which is a spin of the Munich Security Conference, a long-term partner with us. Jennifer, my pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to um, Dr. Frank Niederländer for the introduction. And uh, please let me say a warm welcome uh, again to you. Um, Parakana is our special guest. And of course, uh, to all of you joining us today uh, for this uh, lunch and discussion, as well as uh, to all of you um, following us virtually as uh, we are broadcasting this event. Um, so this hybrid format will be streamed for around half an hour. Um, until we um, will have our lunch so that everyone will be able to follow um, Park's um, presentation, which we will hear in a minute. And um, as responsible leaders, uh, we are deeply convinced that we can all make a difference, as we have seen in the video clip before. Um, more peace, justice and sustainability are main aspects of the UN 2030 agenda. Um, and um, so the foundation as well as its network are committed um, to um, do their best to reach the 17 sustainable development goals. How can each and every one of us participate in achieving this universal call to action concretely? This is the guiding question also in today's discussion. Parag, you were born in uh, 1977 in India, and uh, you are actually what we can consider a real global citizen. You grew up in the United Arab Emirates, in New York, in Germany, and you have been traveling, studying, and working in many more countries around the globe. Um, currently, you are living in Singapore, and uh, I just heard that you are um, flying to Dubai this afternoon. <laughs> um, you are founder and managing partner of uh, Future Map. Uh, which is a data and scenario-based um, strategic advisory firm. Um, you are the author of uh, six best-selling books translated into more than 20 languages. Um, your newest book is MOVE, um, um, which has proceeded by The Future is Asian uh, from 2019. Maybe some of you might know this book and uh, have had the pleasure to read it. Uh, your articles have been appeared in major international publications uh, such as the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Washington Post, uh, Harvard Business Review, Time, Foreign Affairs, Forbes, The Guardian, and uh, Die Zeit, just to name a few. And uh, your TED Talks have been viewed more than three million times. Um, you've provided expertise in many governments um, uh, on the American continent, uh, in the Middle East, Central Asia, Russia, uh, and to Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, around many others. And uh, particularly noteworthy, you served as foreign policy advisor to Barack Obama's presidential campaign. In your new book, uh, MOVE, uh, which we also have uh, above, so you can, uh, we'll have uh, a possibility to have a look into the book or also um, buy it. Uh, you're focusing on increased migration movements um, caused by climate change and how nation states and societies will actually have to use migration movements as an economic chance. Actually, we will have to rely on using mobility um, if we want to remain economically competitive. This is one of your main um, theses. You claim that we are digitally mobile and globally networked and are dependent on migration as human mobility like never before. This being said, um, you have prepared a presentation which we will have the pleasure to see and listen to now. Um, thus, I'm handing over to you, Parak. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. And uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to our discussion with you. Thank you very much. So good afternoon. It's so nice to be to see everyone in person and live together. It's, uh, Still a strange feeling, isn't it, for many of us? Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you, Jennifer, for that uh, warm introduction. And um, I have to say, I, I appreciate being spoken of as, as a guest. And yet, standing here, I mentioned to Frank when I came into the building, I'm having a, had a sense of deja vu. It occurred to me I have been here before. 
and it was certainly in the context of the BMW Foundation, and it has been many years, this wonderful relationship where I have met so many um, fellow so-called, you might say, young leaders from all walks of life, not just from Germany, not just from the United States, but in fact, I would say, from remembering from my time when I was in my 20s, which seems like a really long time ago, <laughs> uh, but that really I can't think of another organization that made such efforts to bring together also Indians, Chinese, Arabs, and others. And that was uh, really among my fondest memories of the various engagements I've had with this foundation over you know, nearly 20 years. So thank you so much for all of the friendship and for being really one step ahead of the curve, I have to say, in appreciating uh, globalization and in taking it very seriously. There have been times over the last 20 years, I can remember, and the, whether we're old or young, we can probably remember that in the last 20 years, quite a few times people have said, globalization is dead, globalization is finished. You heard it exactly 20 years ago, it was the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Then you heard it with the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. You heard it with Trump and Brexit in 2016. And then you heard it with COVID. Every single time people make broad, negative, pessimistic generalizations about the end of globalization. Were they right after 9-11? They were wrong. Were they right after the financial crisis? They were wrong. Were they right when Trump and Brexit happened? They were wrong. Well, what's going to happen now? That's the question. So, you know, the other thing is just, it's, a, you know, sort of almost an uncanny feeling to see the, 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 the phrase mobility here so central in your philosophy. Because when I write a book, I sort of, you know, bury myself in research. And I don't know if anyone cares about the things that I am, or the concepts that I'm putting it absolutely central to a prognosis about the future of the world. When I did the sort of prequel to this book, it was all about infrastructure. Who cares about infrastructure? It's so boring. But to me, infrastructure and supply chains explained everything. You know? And then only when it came out did, did a lot of people come to me and I realized, wow, there is a whole community of people who understand that this is such a crucial part of understanding the structure of our civilization. And so here you are ahead of me with mobility at the center. And the, the punchline of this book, the motto of this book is precisely three words, mobility is destiny. We clearly share that view. So I take it really to heart uh, that we have this, uh, this intellectual unity and community that, that believes in this. But let's still ask the question, are we right or not? What is the future of mobility? Because this was, and I, already, I hear this every day, you will say this is a, surely a very ironic time to be writing this book about mobility and mass migrations and the future of human geography being practically nomadic. You say, well, not really, you know, because again, that is an intimate part of what globalization is. And those who were cynical about it were wrong before and they're wrong again. So let's get into a bit of the argument. You know, I will sort of create an arc towards what I call Civilization 3.0. Civilization 1.0 is in a way our ancient history, which is not so far back, in which we were in fact a nomadic species. For 100,000 years, mankind wandered and spread across the continents. We only became sedentary for those fortunate enough to live in stable geographies and climates over the last several thousand years out of 100,000 years. And then, of course, really with the Industrial Revolution, you could say the world population became, rapidly became more urbanized and continues to urbanize and be more sedentary. So that's, that would be civilization 2.0. What is the future? Uh, now, we still have that infrastructure, right? This is so crucial. The question of mobility is the question of how do we use what we have built, the built environment? How do we use our cities? How do we use our pipelines, our railways, our roads, our airports, our seaports, our internet cables, our electricity grids? All of that is on this map. We have spent 150 years, roughly, particularly the last 75 years, 
building this since the advent of pipelines and long distance railways and so forth, right? The intensification, humankind, every government in the world, our companies, yourselves, spend more money, trillions and trillions of euro every year to build and expand this map. We spend more on this than on anything else. But by the way, no child in any school has this map hanging on their wall, right? And I think that's highly problematic because this is how the world works. This is how we build the world to make it work for us. But we don't teach people that this is how it should be. So the question really is, how are we going to use this connectivity? Connectivity enables mobility. They go hand in hand. Hard to understand one without the other. So let's take a brief detour into geography. For any company interested in mobility, for any people interested in mobility, you must not only understand geography which you can, or, or connectivity, which you cannot take for granted, but I want to go one level deeper into the subject that I am most comfortable with and most passionate about uh, of, any, of any subject, and that is geography. Which I actually began studying here as a student in, in Germany, Erdkunde. <laughs> it was my first class in school in 1994 uh, in, in, uh, in German high school. Uh, so I fell in love with geography a long, long time ago. But, but for many people, and still to this day, geography is one thing. It's Erdkunde, right? It's basically just environmental geography. It's your ecology. And it's not so controversial. We use brown for the deserts and green for the, o for the, for the forest and blue for the oceans, right? And people take it to be static. And our textbooks still make it look static. But even within this one layer of geography, there's a lot of dynamism. The glaciers are melting. There's going to be less white on the map in the future. The sea levels are rising. There will be more blue. We're chopping down the forests. There's going to be less green, right? Or we'll plant new forests, but we'll have to update the color scheme. This is not static at all, right? This is very, very dynamic. And of course, we're realizing that. This is the map that everyone knows. And this is the map that hangs in every classroom and every office around the world. And again, I find it rather sad that we raise our children to think that this is the natural state of the world. We teach them division before we teach them unity. right? We teach them borders before we teach them connectivity. Is it any wonder that generations of people grow up thinking about the world the way they do? It's kind of, it's, it's not a surprise, but it's unbelievably tragic to me. Um, so, and this also is highly dynamic. And this is the, again, an ironic point. This is the map that people treat as sacred everywhere. But of course, the lines are changing all the time. When the United Nations was founded, it had 51 members. It has 200 today. Does any given country necessarily have the right or the permanence that it thinks it has? Obviously not. Does it exist independently of nature? No, it doesn't. Island nations are sinking, aren't they? And of course, it goes on and on. So there's nothing static about it. The functional geography I mentioned earlier, again, we are building and building, and we continue to. And this represents how the world, how our civilization actually works in many ways better than political geography, but it interacts with those layers. They're always interacting with each other all the time. And finally, I would say one of the most important layers, this is the fourth layer of geography, it's the geography of us. Why isn't this map in your office on the walls? Why is this not the map that is hanging in the classroom? Don't we care about the geography of people? Is that not important? I think it's important. So in my maps, every human being is a pixel. You have the dignity of being a pixel. <laughs> there are 8 billion pixels on, uh, on this map. And I'm just focusing on you know, one quadrant uh, here. Um, but of course, the majority of the world population does live in this particular snapshot. So this is human geography, which of course has always been highly dependent on natural geography, on political geography, and on functional geography. Right? And all of those forces dictate where we are. So here's the problem. It's not about saying, well, one view is correct and one is more important. 
think the problem we have is that they are completely out of sync. They are not harmonized. We're dependent on all of these four layers of geography, but there is a tension, a very deep tension right now between them. Think about the geography of people right now versus the geography of resources. Right? Think about the geography of labor and the demand for labor and where the actual workers are. These things are completely out of sync. And we have a problem. Right? This is a species level problem. Who's going to fix it? How are we going to fix it? How do you bring these layers of geography into harmony? Because so many of our problems at a global scale are derived from the mismatch and the misalignment of these geographies. Whatever problem you think you see, go, layer, go, go one level down, 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 you find that the problem is a geographical mismatch, right? So that's the mission, in a way, of this book. And that you won't understand the future of mobility unless you understand that. So let me go back, in case you weren't looking, I'm, I, this was the last map. This is where we are today. Now look very, very closely over the next five seconds. What you've just seen is the layering in of NASA's projection of the change in suitability of the geography, the physical geography of the world. Red means less suitable for human habitation as temperatures rise and other effects uh, kick in. And green means more habitable. Now again, let's talk about mismatch. Which, which countries are the largest food producers on Earth today? It's the United States, Brazil, China, India, and Australia. What color are those countries and large parts of those countries on this map? Not looking so good. Do you remember where the people were on the previous map? What color are the geographies of where those people are right now? Not looking so good. What are the most rapidly depopulating and aging countries in the world with the most abundant natural resources. It's yourselves here. It's the ones in green, right? Mismatch, misalignment, everywhere, literally the whole planet. And no one is going to tell us how to fix this, right? It's not going to be one country, one government, you know, United Nations, or whatever the case may be. This is a collective action problem. This is the collective action problem. So what are we doing? So climate. Climate was the theme of that last map, of course. It has always been you know, sort of one of the critical drivers of where we live, and it will obviously be one of the key drivers of human geography in the future. So the question is, what are we doing about climate change? And here my argument is that we, have, we are making, or trying to make, an extraordinary effort around climate change mitigation, right? Every day a new Manhattan project is launched. Good, we need a thousand of them, right? But even if we reduced all emissions to zero, even if every automobile becomes a hydrogen car or whatever the case may be, um, there is still, of course, enormous volume of carbon emissions baked into the atmosphere, right? The chain reactions have been unleashed. You cannot reverse them. The, one of the most important things to remember when we talk about climate change is that people believe that, okay, if we bring down emissions by a certain amount, we stabilize the temperature, you know, then things will go back to normal. Well, kind of like the post-COVID world of business travel is not going to go back to the pre-COVID world of business travel. You know, the ecosystem doesn't go back. It's not going to look like 1800. It's not going to look like 1900. It's not going to look like 2000, right? It's going to evolve. It's going to evolve in some ways that we can predict and some ways we cannot predict. That's complexity. A complex system never returns to any previous state, right? That's the definition of complexity to some degree, right? So we need to invest a lot more in adaptation also, right? Mitigation matters. Let's do geoengineering. Let's do efforts around renewable energy, of course. Let's decarbonize every single industry we can. And let's do it as fast as we can. You're still not going to stop climate change. 
you're still not going to have that stability that we think we knew, right? There will be changing geographies of stability and instability, livability and unlivability. And every day, already today, people experience, of course, the negative consequences of the climate change that has been occurring and will continue to occur. So therefore, if we have an interest in the preservation of human life, the preservation of the human species, we will put as much effort into adaptation to survival as we do into mitigation. I don't think that's a very provocative or, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, a uh, debatable proposition, right? Do more. But, and this goes to, to some degree, to the Millennium Goals, to 2030, we have, you know, I remember the, the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals, the number of goals has expanded, the number of tools at, at our disposal has expanded. I don't see uh, migration, you know, very prominent among these goals. It's very interesting. For just about anyone who's ever studied the subject, and anyone who's, who has uh, any cognizance of their own family tree, you have migration in your background. You're probably aware that the reason you enjoy the good life you have is because someone in your ancestry at some point moved somewhere. If there's a silver bullet, it's actually human mobility. I don't know why I don't hear that a lot when I follow the COP26 negotiations and dialogue. Could it be that it's governments running the conversation, sovereign governments, for whom the one remaining vestige of sovereignty, because you don't control your currency anymore, you don't control some of your own laws, you can, can't block cyber attacks, you can't block pandemics from coming across your borders, Drugs, what's the one thing left? Even in weak countries, you can control your borders against the movement of people. You can control, inhibit mobility, right? So I don't expect the solution, resettlement of the human population, right? In even a radical way or a gradual way. Don't expect that to be undertaken, uh, you know, easily. I don't expect it to suddenly dawn upon all of the negotiators, uh, let's not talk about decarbonizing this and that, let's talk about mass human resettlement. And I'll tell you what, if you wanna have a serious conversation about the future of climate adaptation for us, you will be talking about it. So a lot of things we can do for adaptation around improving infrastructure, changing the way we build, relocating populations to stable areas where resources are abundant, but doing so with sustainable, uh, infrastructure and, and design and architecture and enabling mobility for everyone, what I call programmable geography, right? Instead of geography dictated by sovereignty, geography is dictated by functionality, right? What is the utility of a place and how do we use that place sustainably for the benefit, survival, well-being of the human population? That's my coinage. I, I long for a post-sovereign world in which there are hundreds of sovereignties Right? We have more countries than we've ever had before, right? And we'll continue to have more countries. And I am actually a believer in self-determination. I'm a Wilsonian. So I want there to be more countries, but I also want there to be more connectivity and more fluidity across them. So that's programmable geography. Now, I won't go into all of the ideas. You're familiar with some of these. What are the ways in which we will get towards this adapted world? So clean energy, as I mentioned, renewable energy that's more localized, geoengineering projects, and even new kinds of infrastructure, new kinds of cities, not just movable people, movable homes, movable buildings, movable cities. The technology is there and it's getting there. And I think it's going to be necessary because we have to cope with a lot of volatility and unpredictability in the world. Fundamentally, actually, despite the title of the, of the book in, in both English and German and the subtitle, it indicates just human mobility. The truth is that what we're living to, and this gets back to globalization, we're living through the mobility of everything. That's what we need to understand. We are the last things that are becoming so seamlessly mobile, right? Mobile phone calls, uh, mobile, of course, you know, digital services, mobile money, mobile education, right? 
everything is becoming, in a way, mobile. And we need to do that as well. And this is all part of our, these are, we're laying the foundations infrastructurally for what we're going to need to survive in, as humanity. And that's fundamentally, philosophically, what I think we need to start to embrace as a concept. And that has many, many, many consequences for, um, for every industry. There's no industry that isn't affected by this growing um, mobility of everything. And most of all, of course, understanding the, the mobility and the geography of people. Whichever industry you're in, chances are it does relate ultimately to human supply and demand and where we are. And if you don't understand where the people are going to be in the future based upon all of this complexity, you're going to make the wrong investments in the wrong places at the wrong time horizon. So understand geography, and most of all, of course, share the mission of the BMW Foundation and embrace mobility. Thank you very much.